Hi everyone, thank you for tuning in. My name is Cassie Riva, I'm the events coordinator at an unlikely story bookstore in Plainville, Massachusetts. Before we start, I wanted to give you a couple of technical tips. Any questions for the authors can be written in the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen or in the chat on the side. And if you'd like to buy this very amazing book, there's a green button at the bottom of your screen that's gonna take you to our website. I am delighted to introduce internationally published author, Crystal Sutherland. Crystal's first novel, Our Chemical Hearts, was published in over 20 countries and made the American Booksellers Association's Indie Next list in 2016. The film adaption, Chemical Hearts, came out in 2020 and was, and was produced by Amazon Studios, starring Lily Reinhart and Austin Abrams. And Crystal served as the executive producer on that project. Her second novel, A Semi-Definitive List of Worst Nightmares, was published in 2017 and was optioned for, it has been adapted it has been optioned for adoption by Yellowbird. My goodness. <laughs> House of Hollow is Crystal's new book, and it's a dark, twisted modern fairy tale where three sisters discover they're not exactly all they seem, and there are definitely some evil things that are going bump in the night. New York Times bestselling author of the Hazelwood series, Melissa Albert, gave House of Hollow a starred review, and she said this haunting modern fairy tale will wrap you up like a glittering fog before going for your throat gives me goosebumps. This book is so good. Crystal has lived on four continents and currently calls London her home. She's actually tuning in from London tonight where it's almost midnight. Thank you so much, Crystal. And joining Crystal tonight is Stephanie Garber, the number one New York Times and Sunday Times bestselling author of the Carnival series, which, she's, which has been translated in over 25 languages. Her newest book, Once Upon a Broken Heart, releases this September. So Stephanie, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hey, Hello. Hello. Oh my gosh, it's so good to see you. It's so good to be here. I know. Thank you so much for coming to chat with me tonight. I'm really excited to uh, to talk about House of Hollow and also maybe a little bit about your new book as well. Ooh. If you <laughs> treat us to a little bit of that, that would be great. Ooh, we can do both. Oh my gosh. Okay. First, I feel like. You know, I'm sure this happens a lot because I think this is like the most gorgeous cover. I, <laughs> I'm a little biased, but I agree with you. It, it is. is totally gorgeous. And I also love that it completely matches the feeling of the book. Like yeah. it's such an atmospheric and beautiful and also creepy at the same time. 100%. Like gorgeously, like disturbing. And so I just love the cover, love the book. And I also love your dress. So um, and since, you know, it's not the same launching virtually, I thought it'd be fun to like show everyone your dress. And then if people want to like do a screenshot, this way it's not like you being like, um. Okay, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to like scooch out from behind my, my bookcase here and give you the full, oh. the full, Oh. Let's see if I can get this all in shot here. But it's oh. Oh, that is dazzling. <laughs> yeah. It's got these big sleeves. I've never really seen anything like this before. So when I saw it, I was like, you know what? This is very house of hollow. I have to have this for my launch week. I love it. And I feel like I actually feel like you might be starting a trend with your sleeve. Um, oh, I, because I know that. another author who bought a dress with big sleeves and they were like, you Crystal Sutherland? Like, these are her author photos. Like, oh I my god. Gorgeous. Well, I can die happy because now I am a style icon. Thank you so much. <laughs> you totally are. I love a puffy sleeve, I gotta say. Yay. Okay, so it's been a really big week. House of Hollow came out. You've had a lot of online events. How are you feeling? I'm feeling so like excited and full of adrenaline still. And, you know, I've done some really late night events because I'm here in London. So I was up until I think 3 a.m. chatting to Melissa Albert a few nights ago. And then you would think I would be so exhausted when I'm ready to go to bed, but I get in bed and my mind is still buzzing and then I'm still awake for an hour afterwards. So I'm just like sleeping in late and staying up late and, having such a wonderful week, uh, talking with some of my favorite authors about House of Hollow. So it's, it's such a joy, honestly. 
Oh, that makes me so happy. I am so glad. It sounds just like how a launch week should be. Yeah. Um. So, okay, before we get into questions, well, this is actually a question, but I feel kind of bad because it's a horrible question. <laughs> I hate it when people ask me this question, but I <laughs> like to ask it. So in your own words, what's like the quick pitch for House Apollo? Oh, I've been practicing this, so I'll, I'll give you I'll give you a good one. Um, so House of Hollow is the story of the Hollow sisters who, when they were children, they went missing off a street in Scotland on New Year's Eve and they disappeared for an entire month. And then one month later, they kind of came back as quickly as they had vanished, but they had no memory of where they had been or what had happened to them. But they came back slightly different. So their hair had changed color, it was dark and it became very light. Their eyes had changed color from blue to black and they each had a small hook shaped scar at the base of their throats. Um, so these are the like tiny clues we get as to what happened to them. And then we flash forward 10 years and uh, our protagonist is Iris, the youngest sister. And she is just trying to kind of live a normal life and finish high school, which is a difficult thing to do living in the shadow of her two older sisters who are these kind of like wild and glamorous and famous women. Uh, so we have Grey, the eldest sister, who is a fashion designer and supermodel. And then Vivi, the middle sister, who is a kind of like punk rock goddess working in like ruin bars in Budapest. And uh, the story really kicks off when the eldest sister, Grey, goes missing for a second time and Iris and Vivi have to team up and follow the trail of breadcrumbs that she left behind to figure out what happened to them when they were children and where Grey is now. Beautifully done. Thank you. <laughs> Um, they're just, okay, from like the first page reading this book, like it's one of those books that pulls you in right away with like the gorgeous writing and the like sense of mystery. Like I think, okay, this wasn't what I'd written down, but like I love how, you know, you tell us these sisters, Vivi and Gray are famous and so like enigmatic and then like it's so real on the page. Like I felt that mm -hmm. same thing. It's like, you know, when you get that first call, I think it was from Vivi being like, we're coming to town. I'm like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> like, just feeling that excitement. Um, and everything is just like so atmospheric and so rich. So I'm curious, like where, where did you first get the inspiration for this book? And like, what was your first seed of like yeah. the inspiration? I think this is such a great question. And Honestly, for my first two books, I would not be able to tell you what the kind of first seed was because I didn't really keep track of it and it kind of just grew over time. And then for this one, I have a very specific memory of where this began, uh, which I think is unusual. I don't know if it's like this for you, if it just kind of like is something that's in the background and then you have a moment of epiphany and you're like, ah, oh, I'm interested in this. But for me, I was uh, I was in Sri Lanka with my partner and his family. His family is from there. And we were going uh, on a kind of like day trip to Anuradhapura, which is the ancient capital of Sri Lanka and is now basically uh, a, a ruined city. And so we were there and we were kind of exploring the ruins where the forest has kind of been allowed to kind of grow up around what is left of, of this old city. And so I kept seeing these doors kind of scattered around the place, these kind of stone doors where the rest of the structure had fallen away and all that was left was a doorway. And you can kind of look around and just like see them popping up through the forest and there was grass all around them and there were tree roots kind of growing around them. And they were just like these ghost doors is what I ended up calling them because they were all that remained. And to me, they felt like kind of like fairy circles out of folklore where, you know, if you see a ring of mushrooms in the forest, you're not supposed to step inside it because I don't know, the fairies will kidnap you or something like that. And I just kind of started to wonder like, what would happen to me if I stepped through one of these doors and I ended up somewhere else? Uh, 
And I didn't know where that would be or kind of what the rest of the story was yet, but that was really the seed. Um, and so when we got back to the car, I started taking notes on my phone and I, I knew I wanted it to be a story about sisters because I'm one of three girls. So I wanted to write about three sisters and I knew I wanted it to have some kind of like forest in it, but that was really what I started with was sisters, forest, creepy doorways. What can we do with that? I love it. And now I'm like, I want to go there because I'm obsessed yeah. with doors and. You would love it. It's really just like one of the most beautiful haunting places I think I've ever seen. Definitely recommend. Mm. And I can totally see how that would start you mm. on, you know, the path that would lead you to writing this book. Yeah. Um, okay. So this is kind of a, well, no. Okay, this is another question that I had. I was just like, okay, it's the last week. So some of these questions are typical and some it's just like, I don't know. I was just trying to think, not last week, like you've done a lot of events. So I'm like, okay, what are different questions like to just kind of go down rabbit trails is kind Correct. of my hope with how to ask questions. Excellent. Okay. I don't know how you feel about this, but honestly, sometimes I'm confused by the way books are categorized. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like I... Honestly, if I had to tell you the difference between like a contemporary fantasy versus a paranormal versus like a modern day fairy tale, I, I don't know that I would give good definitions. So I'm curious, like what category would you give for House Apollo and why? So say you were a bookseller or just you talking to like, you know, someone. Yeah, this is also an excellent question because I think books tend to fall into categories that I don't know, I, I as an author wouldn't have necessarily thought that that was where it fit. But then over time, maybe you see like, ah, oh, of course, that's where it belongs. So when we started talking about House of Hollow as a horror novel, I was like, ah, oh, I'm really concerned that's going to scare some people away. Um, a lot of people are afraid of, of reading horror and they don't like to be scared. And I don't think like this is that scary. Um, but then I thought back on, you know, I'm a big horror aficionado. I love horror movies, but I like a particular kind of horror. I like really smart horror. I like really female driven horror movies. So I love Midsummer and Annihilation and The Babadook and It Follows. And I think House of Hollow really kind of follows in that tradition of this kind of like smart, psychological, thriller, horror, female-led. And so when I started thinking about it in that way, I was like, you know what, this is a kind of folk horror novel where it's it's really rooted in folklore, but it has these horrific elements. So I think if you put it along something like Midsummer, for instance, uh, it makes sense to me in calling it a folk horror. But also dark fantasy also works or dark fairy tale also works as well. But when I think about it, when I conceptualize it, it's a it's a folk horror novel. I love that. I've never heard that before, but I feel like it fits and it makes. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's so. Oh, that's so brilliant. And I would <laughs> totally pick. I think I'd seen it described as like a modern day fairy tale and then body horror. And I was just like, but I felt like nothing quite fit to me, but it's not my book, but that fits exactly. Yeah. So I've just made up my own category, you know, folk horror, because that's a good category. Yeah. yeah I'm going to tell people now that I like reading for full, 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 horror, except apparently I can't say the word. <laughs> okay. So world building, how, like, okay, so you talked about, like, it start, it sounds like your world building started in Sri Lanka. Um, where, where, where'd you go from there? And could you talk about your process a little bit for it in this book? Because the world and the way you approach it is like our world, but it's like our world plus. And yeah. I love like uh, the atmosphere of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'll, I'll talk about two, um, two kind of aspects of, of how I delved into the atmosphere. And the first is Thinking of like London as a character in and of itself. So I grew up in a small town in Australia, very far away from London, but also I, I dreamed about visiting London one day so much as a kid. And London kind of lived in my mind as a fictional place. Like there was 
Narnia and there was, you know, Middle Earth and there was Hogwarts and there was London. Like they may as well have all been fictional places as far as I was concerned. And so London in my mind is this kind of ancient city steeped in magic um, where it's almost always kind of gray and overcast and around every corner you might just stumble into something supernatural. And I wanted to capture that feeling in House of Hollow, uh, the London that I kind of grew up thinking about. And then of course I moved to London while I was writing House of Hollow, which was just an amazing opportunity to be in the place that you're writing about. So I would often kind of go on the journeys that my characters went on in the book. So I would get on the tube, and I would go from like Golders Green to, you know, Leicester Square or wherever they were catching the tube. And I would kind of take note of the sounds and the smells and the people and take notes on my phone. So that was really important for building atmosphere. And then the second aspect was I had this kind of master document of all of these of words or word associations or themes, I suppose, that I was trying to capture within that atmosphere. And so it was like smoke and earth and greenery and rot. And then from those words, I would jot out lots of other words that were kind of associated with that core theme, so words and ideas. And that would be my reference that I would come back to whenever I felt like I'd strayed too far from what I was trying to do. I would come back to that and kind of recenter myself to kind of recapture the atmosphere that I was trying to, to imbibe in this book. I love that. And I do word lists. I'll do them for characters. Yeah. Ah. Like, these, these are the words for this character. And I will only use these words for this character. And I will only use these words for this yeah. character. Like That's just so they're, awesome. you know, those, yeah. and I feel like, because I feel like even as people, there are certain things that we say or that people associate with us. So, yeah, uh, but I've never quite done it with the world. And I like that. Yeah, uh, I found it really useful, but I love the character idea as well. I'm going to have to try that for my it. It's It's helpful for me. Like I'll do it in a later draft, like not mm -hmm. my early draft, because I feel like yeah, that's too, you know, limiting for me. But like when I start to like define my characters a little more. Yeah. Um, like, okay, this is, I'm going to go through and use all, look at all the words I use to describe them and cut and change and shift. And so I feel like it helps. So useful. Definition. Yeah. Okay. So going off the world building. So, okay. I've already man mentioned, and I think it's worth repeating that I love the atmosphere and the descriptions in House of Hollow. Um, it's such a fantastic blend of creepy and beautiful. Um, so you mentioned, you know, talking about like the earth and the rot and yeah. the nature. Was it intentional? Did you send out to write a book that was both of these elements or was it kind of more organic? Did it become like more creepy as you wrote or more beautiful as you wrote or, you know, a combination? Was that a natural thing or a choice you made? It was very much organic in the beginning, I think, where I didn't necessarily sit down to write a horror novel or to write a dark fantasy. I was just kind of enraptured with the idea of the story and the sisters. And then I, I very distinctly remember one of the scenes that I wrote early on, um, and this I don't think is too spoilery, but there's a, a flower growing out of a wound in one of the character's arms. Um, and I remember I sent one of my early drafts to my agent and she zeroed in on that imagery and she's like, I really like this. I think this is like the right direction for, for this book. And then I was like, yes, I agree with you. I love it. And I kind of went to town then with the, with the flowers and the beauty kind of growing out of the gruesomeness. And what really kind of, I don't know, it, feel, it feels like it gave me permission to keep going down that track was the movie Midsummer, which came out while I was writing House of Hollow, which I don't know if you've seen it, but- I haven't. I'm like, I have to look this up because I had never even- Ah, know. it's wonderful. I think it's one of the best horror movies of the past few years. Um, and it is, it's set in Sweden during a Midsummer festival. And it is the most visually stunning horror movie you will ever see. 
like one of the most visually stunning movies, full stop. Like everything is just colored, covered in flowers, sorry. Um, and it is daytime, like bright, brilliant, sunny sunshine, the entire movie. There's no darkness, which is just so different to any horror movie that I've seen before. It doesn't mm -hmm. use darkness or jump scares as a crutch. But there is such a feeling of dread and eeriness that undercuts the entire thing. Um, and I loved that. And I kind of set myself the same kind of challenge. Like, can I make this book beautiful, but terrifying at the same time? Um, so that became the, the point of reference then for combining these two disparate elements into something that felt so glamorous and so opulent, but at the same time was very viscerally disturbing. I love it. I mean, I think you did a great job. And it also, I mean, just, it, it kind of just reminds me of my favorite subject, which I'm always bringing up, which is vampires. And I think that's why we all love them because it is that combination. Yeah, I feel like absolutely. you did this on so many levels with the book. Yeah. And, you know, from that first moment, I don't think this is spoiler because it's pretty early on where I think it's, um, Iris finds like the paper and the flowers are growing out of the picture. Yeah. The paper, just like, I don't know what this is, but I'm here for it. Yeah. Like, I'm totally here for it. So I think you picked the right track. Um, so along the same lines of like planned versus organic, um, how was your approach to writing this book? Like how much did you plan? How much did you know what happened? And how much kind of went off script? I mean, not without being like specific, obviously, but. Yeah, of course. So I think and you probably get this question a lot as well, but are you a pantser or a plotter is a question that I, I frequently get. And I've had to think about my answer a lot with this book because I didn't necessarily sit down and plot out uh, specific plot points that I wanted to have in the story. I rather, I plotted the emotions that I wanted readers to feel as they moved through the, the book, which was something I hadn't done before but when i when this was like explained to me for the first time i was like oh my god that makes so much sense and it ends up being a little bit of an emotional roller coaster like you want them to feel like high highs and low lows one after the other after the other to keep people kind of turning the page and so that became the skeleton then that i wrote the rest of it over and kind of tried to line up big points in the story with where I wanted my readers to feel particular things as they're turning through. Um, so that was the kind of plotting that I did, which was different to any other kind of plotting I'd done before, but made the story somehow much more malleable. I think in previous drafts of previous projects, I've been very kind of wedded to the story as it was and, and didn't really, I don't know, give myself enough opportunity to open it up to other options. But with this one, it was like, I want the reader to be really, really sad at this point in time. And if the, if the approach that I had tried in my first draft wasn't resonating with my editor, I was really kind of open to just going back to that, you know, story point and reimagining what happens there so that I can achieve the same emotional goal of having the reader be like afraid for the characters or or sad about something that's happened. Um, so it was it was so fun and it was so interesting to be like, OK, let's just reimagine this from scratch. What can happen here? I love that. I feel like I want to try that now because that just that just sounds so fun. It sounds yeah. like a fun way to, you know, just kind of get new creative ideas to bring new life into a project. Yeah, it was really, it was really freeing in a way. Like, are you, are you usually a pantser or a plotter? Do you know much about what's going to happen in the story before you get into it or? It like, just, so I feel like it's different with every book. If I'm doing a sequel, yeah. I have to plot a lot more. So yeah. I I have learned I cannot pants a sequel. I have to know the beginning, the end, and the basic, the basic like outline. For I sure. For first book, um, I give myself a lot more freedom. Like yeah. um, Once Upon a Broken Heart, which is the book I have coming out this fall, I yeah. need the whole first half. Okay. I need the whole first half until the midpoint. Cause yeah. I was like, I was writing to get to the midpoint, and then I was like, 
And then I don't know what happens after this, but I set up enough things that it's like, the way I saw it was like, I set up enough choices that my character could decide to go down a number of things. And there was a clear path she actually needed to take, but she just had choices in how to get there. So um, I like to give myself for the first book, like have, I, I spend a lot of time with the setup and then give myself freedom with the end being like, I don't want to, I don't actually know how it's going to end. It could end like this or this or this. So I give myself yeah. options. Um, yeah. No, I love that. I love kind of, and it, it can be a little bit daunting because you don't necessarily know what's going to happen in the story. And, yeah. if, you know, if you're talking about it to, you know, your family or your friends, they're like, so how does it end? And you're like, I don't know yet. I'm still yeah. figuring it out. I think people who are not writers don't necessarily understand. You can kind of discover it along the way. It doesn't come yeah fully formed but that was like with House Apollo as well for a long time I didn't know exactly what the ending was but just found it in the writing process and I think that just makes sense like when you set up a good story like there's a natural end that you're going to find yeah um okay so switching gears a little because we have not talked about the sisters yet um so I want to talk a little bit about the sisters and you probably get this question a lot but um since you mentioned that you're one of three sisters i have to ask <laughs> are any of them based on you or your sister look <laughs> i think parts of, parts of <laughs> yeah i think people really want you to say like this character is based on me or this character is based on my sister but honestly i have put little bits of myself in each of the sisters i'm definitely most like iris who is kind of like goody two shoes and just kind of wants to like blend into the background get her work done and be normal. But, you know, Vivi and Gray are these kind of larger than life characters. And they were the women I wanted to be when I was a teenage girl. Uh, in, you know, they're very different, but like, of course you want to be like the, the creative fashion designer or the rock star, um, the, the rebel and, I kind of put little actual pieces of myself into them and also little like dream pieces of myself into them. And I think what Gray and Vivi kind of most embody about me, because I'm the eldest of three girls, is kind of my protective nature over my younger sisters. Uh, But mostly I am an Iris because I think a character like Iris is a much kind of more gentle way into a story like this. I think Grey and Vivi are a bit harder to get close to, even as a writer or a reader. Uh, Iris is the most open. So, yeah, she's the most me and the one I decided to go with ultimately as the protagonist. I like it. And I get that. People ask me a lot if Scarlet yeah. and Tell are based on me and my sister. Yeah. It's like a very similar answer. Like, yeah. Scarlet's more like me and Tell is more like the girl I wish I was, that yeah. big bolder character okay do you have a favorite of the three (laughs) i do actually and my favorite to write not my favorite as like a person but my favorite to write probably was gray the eldest sister just because i find her such a fascinating character you know she is this young woman she's 21 in the book uh but she is so aware of her own beauty and so willing to wield it as a tool and as a weapon. And she just moves through the world with so much power in this entirely unapologetic way. Like she fears nothing and she knows that no one can touch her. And honestly, like, isn't that just all of our dreams? Like, I I remember thinking this when I was reading uh, The Power for the first time, you know, where women get the power of electricity in their hands and the power dynamics just completely switch. I think Grey is kind of a little bit inspired by that. Like, what would it feel like to move through the world as a young woman if you knew that no one could touch you and you're always safe and you always had the power? So I just thoroughly enjoyed writing this, like, fully emboldened character of of Grey. I could see that. I mean, she's so Mm -hmm. fascinating. Did you know... Did you know the whole time about the fashion or did that ever change, like, what her job and, you know, like, I think it's... I think it's a big undertaking and exciting to be like, okay, these are two famous characters. So yeah. did Gray and Vivi's like jobs or what made them famous ever change? Or was it the same like throughout the whole time? Gray was the one who was the most fully formed in the beginning of all the three sisters actually. 
So Grey kind of remained unchanged. I think she became more morally Grey as my drafts progressed and I kind of decided more of her motivations and who she was. Uh, but Iris and Vivi were kind of switched in the beginning, actually. So Vivi in the in the final draft is very rebellious, and Iris is uh, is very kind of like goody two shoes and and the teacher's pet a little bit. But in one of the very early drafts, it was completely switched, and it was Iris the rebel, and Vivi was off at university, kind of like being the goody two shoes and studying, and it just didn't sit quite right because Iris then didn't feel like a good window into the story yeah. and she was the one who had kind of you know was estranged from her elder sisters and it it just didn't gel right like she needed to be the one who had been left behind I think and that ultimately I don't know you probably get these moments as well where you it's just like a moment of epiphany and everything feels like it falls into place, like all the puzzle pieces finally fit together. And when I switched their their personalities around super early on, it's like, ah, oh, yes, that is it. That is what needs to happen for this story. And then from then on, it was very much like easy to to write those girls in in their different ways. Um, and they became like they came to fully embody the characters that I gave them. But something wasn't working in the first draft and. I needed to make the switch. But I think that's I think that's so interesting and such a good way of looking at it because it's like I feel like I will have these ideas for characters but they're not mm -hmm. usually my main characters because mm -hmm. you know the character like you say that makes the best window and the best intro yeah. to the story sadly I don't know why isn't always the most fascinating. Yeah. Because I mean, like, Iris is great. Not that she's not, you know, but Yeah, I mean she's not the most interesting of the three sisters, but she's yeah. the one we need to spend the most time with because she's kind of like us, right? She doesn't understand the mysteries of her other sisters or the mysteries of the world. And it's why, you know, in Star Wars, Luke Skywalker is the protagonist, not, you know, Obi-Wan, because Obi-Wan knows all the secrets already. And we need to be with the main character who, who can ask questions. Yes. And be, and be like told answers and that is how we reveal the world rather than just saying like this is what's happening we find out at the same time as our main character does and that's what makes it interesting and compelling as we read i agree i agree and i just watched a master class where shonda rhyme said like that exact same thing bless her shonda i know she's great mm -hmm. um Okay, so I know we're gonna get to questions from everyone, but I have just a couple more. So if you have a question, start asking because we'll get to everyone's questions soon. Um, so House of Hollow is your third novel, right? Yeah. Third novel. Um, how has your writing and storytelling changed since Our Chemical Hearts, which was your first novel, or has it changed? I think so much because, you know, Chemical Hearts was my first book that was published. And it's contemporary. So a question that a lot of people have had for me is like, why did you make the switch from contemporary to horror? Like, how did you make the switch? What does this mean? Why have you done this? Are you gonna keep doing this? And my answer is that I decided I was gonna be an author or I wanted to be an author when I was about 18. I just finished high school. And I started writing my first unpublished, very terrible manuscript. Uh, and I was really into, when I was a teenager, like fantasy and science fiction and thriller, like this was my bread and butter and what I read. And this is what I started out writing as well. So my first ever book was this epic fantasy and everyone finds this hilarious. So I'm going to tell you about it as well. It was about vampires on hoverboards, which I think is just a genius idea <laughs> in <a> retrospect <laughs> because oh God, that's awesome that is that is amazing and i wrote this completely seriously so this was like peak twilight time vampires super hot but i was like i'm gonna do something really cool and different and combine vampires and sci-fi and there are going to be like magicians and fallen angels and spaceships and vampires on hoverboards. I'm just going to take everything that I've ever loved about every genre that I've ever read and put them in one manuscript. And let me tell you that 
doesn't work. Sometimes there are too many ingredients in a soup and it doesn't taste good. But this is what I loved writing. And so I wrote two more manuscripts after that one where I was really exploring genre fiction. So like supernatural thriller or science fiction or fantasy. I've always kind of liked to blend different elements. And then Chemical Hearts um, almost kind of happened by accident. It was a book that kind of just poured out of me um, where, and this is the only time I've ever really felt like the flow that authors talk about sometimes where it's just like every day they have to be at their computer and they're just compelled to write it. I felt so compelled to write this book because I was going through my first like real breakup at the time. I was at university and had my heart broken. I was just kind of writing about it every morning, every evening, pouring it into this book. And then it came out and I was, I was a contemporary writer by accident because I'd, I'd been writing fantasy for, for seven or eight years by that point. And so then with my second book, uh, A Semi-Definitive List of Worst Nightmares, it's almost like a bridge back towards what I was writing before. So it's kind of magic realism, uh, death is a character, and all of these strange kind of things happen around these characters where you're never really sure if what is happening is real or if it's in the characters' heads. And then with House of Hollow, I felt like I, I had permission again to go back to what I loved to write when I first set out to be an author. Um, but I'm really glad that I kind of waited this long to write a book like this because I feel like I had many more tools in my tool belt as a writer to to tackle a, like what is essentially a portal fantasy uh, like this because I think if I'd started out with this when I was 18 would not have been able to do a story like this justice and there would have been vampires on hoverboards which is just no good for anybody but the vampires on the hoverboards make a great story <laughs> Like, I feel like you need a book where someone's, like, reading a book about vampires on hoverboards. Yes! That's genius. I'm going to put that in my next book. Love it. Please do, because I'm like, this is, like, the best. I always love hearing, like, what was your first book? And this might be my favorite first book. <laughs> Wait, what was, the, what was your first attempt at a book before we, before we move on? It was a portal fantasy. Ah, oh, Amazing! Mm -hmm. It was two sisters and it was yeah. like they um, one of them found a cursed book and when she would okay. read it I was just like this is so genius because she'll read it and then the reader will be reading it with her oh. and I put like every I, I was a really good writer at the time and I had a whole list because I knew everything about writing which means I knew nothing it was I had a whole list of every adverb I could think of <laughs> Because I thought that was how you wrote. Like, you just attached oh, yeah. adverbs to yeah. of every dialogue tag. Like, oh, oh, yeah. he said lovingly. He said dramatically. Like, mm. it was, the writing was just real great. And uh, <laughs> it was just, you know, it was just very, it was just, it was all the tropes I loved. But kind of yeah. like what you were talking about with, like, the genre soup. Mine yeah. was, like, trope soup. Like, rather than oh, no, yeah. you pick a trope, you lean in. It was just, like. Yeah, I put everything in there, and yeah. it was just like this huge fantasy world that was just really big and didn't have a lot of explanation behind it. So it was like, yeah, this is just the way it is, and I just threw magic, like it was spaghetti to a wall. So um, I think you um, you you just have to do this when you're learning how to write, though. This is yeah. this is how you learn. You you take all of the things that you love and you try and combine them together in ways that just do not work and do not make sense. You don't know that yet. And I feel like what happens is kind of your naivety is what gets you through in the beginning. And then the more you know, the more your confidence goes down. Like when I was writing my first book, I was like, this is genius. I'm going to be the next JK Rowling. This is a get rich quick scheme. I'm going to be a millionaire in no time. And now that I'm like 10 years in and I know how to write a book, this is terrible. Every word I write is garbage. I have to come back and edit this 10 times. I just wish I had that early novelist confidence again sometimes. But yeah, <laughs> I feel like I'm like, I wish I could just forget everything I know about dry writing to draft yeah. a book because I'm like, I feel yeah. like you need to draft like that early novelist. Yeah. 
and I'm really bad at that. I'm really bad yeah. at shutting off my inner editor. It takes me like a year to finish a draft. Yeah. Um, which is tragic because I'm like, I'm a way better reviser than drafter, but it's like, yeah, I see all the flaws. Draft like an early novelist, edit like you are now. That yeah. would be ideal, but unfortunately, doesn't work like that. I know, but maybe we can find it again. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Since I know we need to get to questions. Um, so I want, I, I don't want to spoil the ending of House of Hollow, but I felt as if there could be another book. Are there more books? Can you say if there are more books or are you just? I, I feel like I left it open enough for myself that I can return if I decide to. So with my first two books, I feel like those stories very much were like, I told the stories I wanted to tell. I left the characters where I left them. They're off doing their own thing now. I have no idea where they are, if they're even speaking to each other anymore. I'm not sure. And then with this one, you know, I, I so enjoyed being in this world and I loved being with these characters and it's so rich and interesting and I would go back there in a heartbeat in the future at some time, maybe. So it's a solid maybe on a, on a House of Hollow sequel. We will see. Can you tell us anything about what you're working on next? Are you working on something next? Yeah, I'm working on another draft of something that feels kind of in the same vein of House of Hollow, where it's kind of, I mean, I, I kind of consider them my London duology, even though they have nothing to do with each other. Um, so this is also set in London, and it's also kind of this like folky horror book where the supernatural just kind of gently presses up against our contemporary world. And it is about these three kind of lonely teenage girls from very different backgrounds who each through happenstance have some link to the occult. Um, and then there are a series of murders in London where it becomes apparent that each of the murders is also linked to the occult in some way. And then these three girls kind of happen across one of these crime scenes and then decide that they are going to band together and try and figure out who is committing these crimes. Uh, so that at the moment is uh, has captured my attention and I'm delving into this world of dark underground London and the occult and kind of serial killer thriller genre. So yeah, it's a supernatural serial killer thriller, and I'm having so much fun with it. It sounds awesome. I already can't wait to read it. I am I would have just been here for a supernatural serial killer thriller, <laughs> yeah. but that pitch sounds awesome. Thank you. Yay. Okay, so I think we can open it up to questions. Yeah. Yes. Or if I'm moderating that, or if- I can do that for you. Okay. This one's from Buffalo Street Books. Crystal, you said House of Hollows is a dark modern fairy tale. And Stephanie, you said Once Upon a Broken Heart is your love letter to fairy tales and villains. Which fairy tales have influenced you the most and which fairy, fairy tale tropes do you find you can't stay away from? Ooh, I think, um, so my favorite fairy tale is Little Red Riding Hood. And I, there's a particular image, I think it's an etching from a, like an 18th century printing of Little Red Riding Hood, which I'm sure you've seen because it was a very popular image on Tumblr like 10 years ago probably, where the wolf is kind of circling Little Red and they, they're like locking eyes and it's this really weirdly sensual image. And I have always loved that image and I always have loved Little Red Riding Hood. And then I've kind of come to realize in retrospect that House of Hollow is, is very like tied in with Little Red Riding Hood. Like the, the horror of discovering that somebody that you love is like a wolf in sheep's clothing or that they are more monstrous than they first appear, like the wolf dressed in the grandmother's clothes. Um, so I think that's like one of the first fairy tales that I ever remember being told. And to me, it's the one that I ever, I always keep coming back to and trying to kind of capture some of that, that spirit in, uh, in the books that I write. So that's it for me. Ooh, I, I remember, so I think I actually have them somewhere on my bookshelf, like getting the original, like Grimm's fairy tales. 
um, when I was like in the sixth grade or fifth grade, sometime in elementary school, and reading the original Cinderella and where you find out that the stepsisters to fit their shoes in, they cut off their toes and then they cut off their heels. And then at the end of the story, they get their eyes pecked out with birds by birds. Oh my and God. I it was just like, oh, it was just like this eye opening thing for me because wow. I think, you know, and I think it's part of the reason why I loved House of Hollow is like the combination of like the fairy tale and then the like total darkness that like, yeah, oh, it goes there. So I think for me, like, I love, like, so much of what Crystal was talking about tonight, where I love, like, the magic of a fairy tale. I love the enchantment. I love, you know, I will never get over a handsome prince, but I love the idea of a handsome prince not really being the handsome prince that we thought. Oh, and yes. I love the idea of, you know, going there by cutting off your shoes or cutting off your toes or whatever needed yeah. to do. So, like, I like adding something really dark into it. Yeah. Uh, and so I think it's that combination of like whimsy and what the heck. Yeah, I think nothing is as it first appears in a fairy tale. Like yes. It can be switched around at the drop of a hat. And I think that's what House of Hollow does and what all the like our favorite fairy tales from our childhood do as well is, is trick you into a false sense of security and then turns it on its head. Exactly. This one is from Alexa, Crystal, and Stephanie. How different is it for you to focus on siblings rather than just a main character or a group of friends? How do sibling dynamics, their little strifes and inside jokes and shared trauma and joy affect your character designs? Asking as a reader who loves sibling stories and who has two older siblings and a twin brother. I loved writing about sisters because I am one of three girls and so I had so much material to use uh, from my own childhood with growing up with these two like amazing but incredibly frustrating women who were such a and, and are still such a big part of my life and I've said this in in some of my like written interviews before but a lot of the sweeter moments and then some of the more sinister moments as well in the book are directly inspired by the relationship that I have with my sisters. And so there's one in particular where Iris talks about how she couldn't sleep at night uh, without being able to touch her sisters and feel their pulses. And that was totally me when I was 12 years old. I was terrified of the dark. I was the eldest sister, so I was the one who was supposed to be protecting my younger sisters. But they were never scared of the dark, so they were the ones who had to protect me. And so I would go and wake them up and bring them into my bed. And then I would like position them on either side of me and then hold their hands. And that was the only way that I could fall asleep <laughs> because I was so scared of being alone in the dark. So little things like that, like exploring this intense and intoxicating and frustrating relationship that you have with these people who really, when you think about it, are the only other people who will ever understand the world from your exact perspective because you have, you, you have the same parents, you grew up in the same house. They are the people who see the world the way that you do more than anyone else. And I wanted to kind of try and capture some of that experience um, with, with these three girls. Yeah, how was it for you? I think, so with Caraval, it was like the easiest in for me because I, I have a younger sister. Yeah. We're super, super close. And so it was really easy for me to write about that relationship. But mm. I think also like friendships, I don't actually like writing friendships so much in mm. books because I feel like books are built on tension mm. and I don't have tension with my friends <laughs> and, and I don't like reading relationships where female friends have tension. Cause for me, it's like your girlfriends are your support system. They're <laughs> yeah. like the people who like, even if they don't agree with some of the choices you're making, they're like, we love you. You're awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I can't handle it when those relationships get tense. But with siblings, I love it because, and I and I think this is what makes it so powerful. It's like that, like we might fight, but I'll also kill someone for you, like yeah. not in real life, but like in a book where it's like, you know, like Scarlet and Tella. It's like they not see the world the same way. They have different approaches to things, but they will literally die for each other yeah. and so I love it because it's like you get that intense love but you can also have that tension because at the yeah. end of the day 
you know these people love each other, but they're going to make choices that frustrate each other so much. And so I feel like it's it's more exciting to write sibling relationships and like you, like I definitely like, especially with the sweeter moments, it's like pouring that in because I was definitely mm. super overprotective of my sister growing up and yeah. I love her. And, you know, so it was really just easy for me to put a lot of feels in that were real. Yeah, I really like your point of like, you you can fight with them, but still be willing to kill someone for them. Like I have had fights with my sisters, not in my adult life, but kind of when I was a teenager and growing up that I would never have with my friends. Just yeah. the intensity of your fights and the intensity of your love are just so at odds with each other, but it's everything is so heightened in a sibling relationship. Yeah. It's really interesting to, to write about. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's just, it's just you you have more freedom with it and it's more yeah. fun and you know and it is fun to like take those little details and yeah in the books yeah for sure this one is from andreas when you write a novel do you take time off to write shorter stories or perhaps poetry too or is it more that you prefer to remain in the headspace um i'm very much in in the in the headspace kind of person um i i love to like fill my well though as I am writing and I know some writers are very much they don't like to read anything they don't like to consume anything else while they're drafting and I'm the complete opposite if I am not reading someone else's book at the same time as I'm writing my book I cannot compose the sentence like I completely forget what a paragraph is what is what is voice what is like rhythm I cannot do it without pouring other words in at the same time as I'm putting words out so I read poetry because I think poetry is really wonderful uh, to inspire interesting ways to write prose. Um, and I listen to a lot of music and I watch a lot of movies and I read a lot of books. But when I'm focused on one project, I find it so difficult to kind of be creative with another project and give myself over to that as well. So it's very much kind of one, one track for me. Same. I can't, yeah. I actually don't think I could compose a short story. Mm. Um, the only thing I do. I need 80,000 words to, to get my point across. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing I do do is if I am turning something in and I have time, I'll start notes on another story. It's hard for me to like jump between projects and my editor usually reads really fast, but it does take me so long to get into a story. Yeah. So I don't usually take those as breaks. Like... I usually take that as time to like brainstorm or figure out like what I'm doing next. Yeah, absolutely. What books that are coming out this year have you read and loved and what and which ones do you recommend to the readers? Um, the book I've just finished reading is The Electric Kingdom by David Arnold, which is a phenomenal kind of post-apocalyptic book, but filled with so much heart and it's just like this interesting nesting doll filled with different characters and different timelines. And I would highly recommend it for fans of Station Eleven, which is another book that I absolutely adore by Emily St. John Mendel. And then the book that I'm probably like most excited for, which is coming out later this month, is Witches Steeped in Gold, which I haven't read yet, but I've heard so much buzz about. Um, Beasts of Prey is coming out later in the year as well. And then, of course, Once Upon a Broken Bra, oh, which I can't wait for. Yay! <laughs> um, I, so, okay, so a couple of my favorite reads that I've already read, Luck of the Titanic by mm -hmm. Stacey Lee. Um, she's my critique partner, and so I've read this book a couple times. And it takes the story of the Titanic, but from the perspective of one of the Chinese passengers who was on board. And so she got the idea for this book because there were eight Chinese passengers on board the Titanic and their story was never told. Mm -hmm. um, so she retells the story, um, highlighting their journey. And the book is just full of so much heart and um, just you learn things that you didn't know about the boat even now, which I think is such a great way to tell it. And so it's a great book. I really loved that piece of historical fiction. It comes out May 4th. And then the other book I really loved was Six Crimson Cranes by Elizabeth Lim. 
And that is a fantasy and it's a very fairy tale. Like she pulls from a lot of different fairy tales mm -hmm. and it's super quirky. It's like super quirky. She made some choices that I, when I, as soon as I finished, I messaged her and I was like, I do not know how you pulled this off, but I am so amazed. Um, and that was just a really refreshing and beautiful and fun book. There's also a super hot dragon in it. So I was there for it. We love um, that. Yeah. So I think those are a couple of the books. I know there are other ones that I can't think of off the top of my head, but I think those are some of the earlier ones. Oh, and then right now I'm reading The Hawthorne Legacy, um, which is the sequel to The Inheritance Games by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. And oh, cool. Yeah. I loved the first book. So I'm super excited about diving in. I'm, I've been really enjoying, I mean, I'm really enjoying the sequel. Blah can't think right now <laughs> awesome i think that was the last question i just finished i'm gonna come back on screen i just finished um the ladies of the secret circus by constant sayers oh. it's very good it's not ya um it's very good it's about oh. this like hidden circus in paris that's run by demons it's oh. wild it's a wild book it's kind of like an episode of the supernatural but like oh it's wild God. it's really good you're really I selling it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you had me at that title <laughs> yeah. oh my God. click that green button and purchase a copy of house of hollow or her other books we also have all of stephanie's books available you can purchase by clicking that green button you're going to support an independent bookstore and you're going to support these two wonderful ladies thank you both so much this was so much fun i can't believe it's been an hour I know that went crazy. So I know. And Crystal, crazy. I've been so focused on your amazing dress that I didn't realize your amazing earrings. So these are actually iris flower earrings for my main character, Iris. So there you go. Fully in theme tonight. It's amazing. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Have a great night. Thank you so much for having us. Bye. Bye.